Hi, everybody, and, and welcome. Um, on behalf of the panel participants, I want to thank you for choosing to spend your time with us today. The topic that we'll be chatting about today is digital trade, digital platforms, and digital investments, the key to financial inclusion in Indonesia. And it's a topic that I've spent a lot of time thinking about and chatting about, including to some of the panelists over the past few years. And I've actually deployed quite a bit of capital into that thematic too, so I'm really hoping it works out. Um, we do have a great lineup of experts to discuss this with. We've got Claudia, JJ, and Vince. I'll get them to introduce themselves in just a second. Um, I'll be moderating the discussion. I, I'm Tushar Roy, partner at SquarePeg, based in Singapore. We're a global VC that invests in exceptional founders of tech companies across Southeast Asia, Australia, and Israel. Manage more than a billion dollars of capital commitments and have partnered with Indonesian companies like Credible and Puan. Uh, I actually sit on Claudia's board, uh, where I basically do whatever she tells me to. Um, <laughs> let's, uh, let's get some intros going and then we can get into some Q&A. Um, why don't we get you guys to introduce yourselves. Let's go Claudia, then JJ, then, then Vince. Yeah, hi. Thanks, Sush. Nice to see you again. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I'm Claudia. I'm founder at Pluang. So Pluang, we're a wealth tech that's actually based in Indonesia. Um, we are an investing super app, basically. Everything from crypto to mutual funds to stocks. Yeah, um, a little bit about myself. Thank you, Claudia. Hi, hi guys. This is JJ. I'm, I'm Chief Strategy and Chief Financial Officer at Gudangada. So we're one of the largest and fastest growing uh, B2B e-commerce player, marketplace players in uh, Indonesia. Been founded for about three years, uh, led by our founder Pat Steven, and uh, been growing strength to strength for the past kind of like couple of years. Uh, that's a great intro. Thank you. Hi, Tush. Uh, good to meet with you. Um, hi, everyone. Claudia, uh, JJ. Uh, my name is Vince. I'm the CEO and co founder of Dana. Uh, Dana is one of the leading digital uh, wallet players in Indonesia. It's a very exciting market. Awesome. Thanks for the interest, guys. Let's let's get into the discussion. And, and please, all of you, feel free to, to chime in with your views. And and you know, and if you know me, you know that I love it when people disagree with each other. So let, let's see if we can get some of that going as well. Um, let, let's start by setting setting the scene first on on the state of financial inclusion and digital options in Indonesia. And maybe maybe Vince, we can start with you first. Um, where do you actually see things currently when it comes to financial inclusion, digital transformation, what are the problems that you think uh, need to be solved? Certainly, be happy to. So um, really, I truly believe we are actually still far from a full financial inclusion and digital transformations. Um, what we're all experiencing here now as, a, you know, as the panelists and I'm pretty sure as uh, participants of the summit, uh, is that we are all still in a, uh, at the tip of the iceberg. The, there is an immense opportunity um, uh, for a, a massive growth, uh, and really that's why Dana was established as a uh, as a form of our core purpose, right? Um, uh, we truly see that um, uh, from the moment that we established our company four years ago. Um, and until now, we've had a tremendous growth. And this is actually indicating that the, the demands for financial inclus inclusions and also the financial literacy, uh, it's really, really big. And we have three stakeholders that we always uh, put our, at our forefront, which is consumers, merchants, and financial institutions. And this is our, the target market that we are trying to address. And really, there is a massive potential is there um, some of the facts, right? Um, according to uh, the World Bank Digital Economy um, Household Survey, 48% uh, of all households in Indonesia are still excluded from financial services, and only 9% of all households are, are users of digital finance services. Um, Bain and Google Temasek um, also had a, a report uh, for its fulfilling its promise uh, on DFS in 2019. Of 181 million adults in Indonesia, 51% are unbanked and 26% are underbanked. So if you take a look at it, right, overall there are 77% of potentials uh, for this financial uh, service inclusions. So one of the key here, right, that's why I, we truly believe in our mission and vision. Uh, so initial touch points for digital financial services 
is generally starting from digital payments. Because digital payment at its core is a bridge between the cash culture and the banking instruments. So that's why for the past um, uh, four years, the growth of the digital payment in Indonesia has been tremendous, right? And I'm, I truly believe that there is going to still going to be a lot of opportunity. There is going to be a lot of the market that we can address um, in a lot of uh, segments, right? Um, not only digital payments, but digital remedies, you know, lending, um, uh, investment, um, you know, uh, Claudia and JJ, right? Um, and that exciting flywheel effect, um, it's actually what makes us exciting uh, to be in this market. So we really, really believe that Indonesia, it's still um, early stage and there's a lot of potential to be had. Got it, got it. Any, anything to add from you, Claudia or JJ? I mean, you guys all look at very different segments of the market as well. How are you seeing seeing financial inclusion and digital transformation? Yeah, Claudia? I guess. Um, yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think in general, um, I completely agree with Vincent here. You know, payment is actually the infrastructure that leads to the other products, right? And so we're seeing a, a huge explosion, right, um, in growth in basically investing. So financial literacy, however, is still very low. So I think that's that's the biggest concern. We we see financial literacy; it's still under forty percent. And I think I think that's almost bigger concern, which is that you are seeing inclusion move at a faster rate than literacy. <laughs> um, and I think I think we need to do better, frankly, at financial literacy and combining that with the financial inclusion element that has grown quite a bit actually over the last two to three years especially due to COVID. yeah I, and i would just kind of like quickly add on my side because uh, we're, we're, we're operating in slightly different spaces as well but you know in, gen in general like we're very much in agreement from a macro perspective um i would say that like you know from from, from our perspective we do think that um you know, Indonesia is starting to enter on the cups of entering into, I would call it the second phase of financial digitalization. Um, so, you know, people have been exposed to the digital payments and the financial inclusion at a very basic level. Um, but like, there's a lot of runway for you to, 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 to adopt, to increase the adoption rate in more use cases and to kind of like mature the use case. So I think then from a strategic, from a more macro level as well, if you look at the Indonesian government having the ambitions to accelerate the distribution of, uh, of digital infrastructure through the development of 4G, 5G um, throughout Indonesia, um, I think that, you know, and also the, the country's projection to become the largest digital economy market in 2025 in Southeast Asia. I think, I, th I, th I think financial inclusions target, you know, to, to kind of reach that kind of like 85, 90% in the next couple of years, it's, it's uh, you know, Again, we're at early stages, but you know it's it's uh, it's 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 booming. So it's uh, that 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 will surely come at some yeah. point for Indonesia. Yeah, sounds like there's a lot of exciting growth ahead for for all of you and your businesses. Hopefully, um, look, it wouldn't be a 2022 panel without talking about the pandemic. Uh, let, let's let's mm -hmm. chat quickly about that. Um, you've all had to deal with the pandemic in different ways over the last couple of years. I'm sure it's taken its toll on you, your, your families, but also your staff. Um, but the period has also been a catalyst globally for the adoption of technology and new ways of doing things. And when it comes to digital trade or digital platforms or making payments, uh, can, you, can you just take us through whether your company or sector sort of saw a boost during the pandemic or did it see a fall off during the pandemic? Um, JJ, can we maybe start with you and, and then we can go to the others? Sure. Um, so for us, um, so not only is it sustainable in a, in a post-pandemic world for, 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 for the offline to online in, in the B2B space. I think um, we're seeing that it's going to grow very exponentially and we're still in very early days of the adoption and scale up. And the biggest driver for that is ultimately, you know, this is a very large addressable market um, operating with many inefficiencies along the B2B supply chain over what is a very, very long period of time in Indonesia and the long craving and in need of the right set of solutions. So the pandemic has certainly helped accelerate this um, digital transformation and the online adoption for B2B, um, but with the right execution and with the, the right um, merchant online experience on the platform, it is here to stay. Um, to give you an example, at the beginning of the pandemic, like traders along the supply chain 
um, experienced a significant decline in transactions due to mobility restrictions. Uh, businesses were negatively impacted. Um, at the same time, we've seen real changes in the way our traditional retail partners work on the field. Um, through conducting online transactions on Gudang Ida's platform, um, retailers, um, you know, wholesalers, they now know how to buy stock by going down. Uh, do not have to buy stock by going down to their suppliers physically. They can do it online. Um, helps them to reduce the you know, operational costs, improve their margins. And retailers also now have access to a wider selection of products and sales that can be found on our platform. So Gudang Ida itself, like over the course of the pandemic in the past 12 to 18 months, um, today we have an active data user base of more than three quarter of a million users. And um, this, this, this businesses in combination employ more than 3 million uh, workers. So that is more than 150% growth uh, compared to pre-pandemic. And um, simply put, um, the shift in behavior is here to stay long-term because um, it is much more efficient and at the end of the day is an online solution that is actually good for business, for stakeholders and addressing a big pain point even prior to the pandemic. What about you, Vince or Claudia? Have you have you seen any uptake, and and do you think it's sustainable post pandemic? Um, I'll let Claudia talk first. Oh, okay. Thanks, Vince. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think in general, you know, the the enemy of any fintech is actually cash, right? Uh, so in general, I think it's been obviously very great. So you know, Pulang itself has grown on monthly transacting users over fifty x over the you know one year of the pandemic period and i think this is driven uh by number one i think first-time investors who are now seeking to actually do things online and um you know also being driven by the fact that money is becoming more digital so you know as cash becomes less prevalent people are more afraid to transact in cash um especially with regards to um you know COVID, right, um, we can actually see a huge move into payments like Dana, for example, and GoPay and et cetera. And um, I think that basically drives wealth tech and investing, right? So one does drive the other. And um, it's been obviously a huge blessing um, for any fintech company um, over the period. And we, we do think it's here to stay because as you probably know, especially for wealth tech, the retention of users is really off the charts. So once you really get a user onto your platform, you know, uh, the li lifetime value is actually almost endless. Um, and I think that's that's really, really valuable to have something like the pandemic actually become a catalyst um, to growing the wealth tech space. Yeah, um, I share the same sentiments to JJ and Claudia. Um, I think the pandemic is actually accelerating the adoptions of digital solutions, especially digital payment, financials, um, uh, uh, wealth uh, tech uh, into the market. Um, I'll give you some of the comparisons, right? Um, so Dana was essentially just started about four years ago. We launched our beta versions March of 2018. Uh, we launched the app itself um, uh, actually only on 2018 in December. So 2019 was our first year of uh, uh, practically growing uh, fast. And we did a lot of uh, marketing. We did a lot of push into the market to grow our user base. At the end of 2019, we have about 33 million users. As of last week, we have 100 million users. Um, and that's registered users. Uh, and all of this growth in the last two years are very little marketing driven, very little. And a lot of our organic, uh, mostly organic, and this massive growth is an indication of how people actually perceive that digital payment is becoming an integral part of their life instead of it's just um, uh, good to have instruments, okay? And the key point of this is that um, not only the users are growing, but when we take a look uh, into our own user space, per user's transaction for frequencies grows month to month. And it's been growing since we started. Um, we're now having you know, 
not exact numbers because we haven't disclosed it publicly, but just to say we have more than 10 times transactions per users per month. Well, actually, a lot more than that. Um, uh, and it's it's a uh, it's an indication so that it's the users are staying and that they're not going back. And that's actually um, uh, indicated by the research done also by um, uh, Google's um, uh, from their report from the economy C report that when uh, um, people are shifting to digital payments, 92% actually was intending to stay, right? And then uh, in regards to lending, 58%, in regards to remittance, in 74%. And that's pretty consistent with what we're seeing in our user base as well. So I truly believe that it's there to stay and also is actually going to even more accelerate because of the network effects. Because the more people using it, the more merchants accepting it, the more people are going to be uh, um, growing, uh, the market going to be growing faster. Got it. Sounds, sounds like all of you are experiencing a big uptick in growth through the pandemic, and it sounds like it's, for the most part, um, very sustainable, which is, yep. which is super exciting. Um, let, let's, let's change topics then. Um, enough about the pandemic. Um, let's talk about another one of my favorite topics, which is unicorns. Um, Claudia, let's start with you. You know, many of, many of Indonesia's current generation of unicorns are you know, people say they're solving local problems by tweaking successful approaches of more mature market counterparts like in the US or China or India. Um, but we know that it's not as, is, as simple as that. It's not a simple copy and paste. Can you take us through things that you've done in Pluang, any localizations or other unique things that you've done which have not been seen before on the regional or world stage, which make it make them all unique for Indonesia? Yes, thanks so much, Sushar. Yeah, I think a lot of people think, um, you know, copycat business kind of works. Um, but in, in reality, the complexities of especially a platform like ours, which is FinTech, is actually very high. Um, so, you know, I think you are starting to see a trend towards the super app model, which means that, you know, having everything from crypto to stocks and under one platform in other countries and more developed countries. And I think that's pretty much what we've done at Wong as well. The really biggest difference, I would say, um, is actually related to the consumer behavior, especially related to first time investors. You know, I think if you, you're talking about a country like the US or some of these developed markets, a lot of individuals already have banks as like their primary use case. And wealth tech is actually just an addition to the use case on banks. But we're actually seeing something very different. Um, in Indonesia, where users are actually engaging with wealth tech platforms first, um, you know, and a lot more times than even their banking and um, you know wallet counterparts, and I think that's a very interesting phenomenon that is very unique to the country and something that is a trend that, in my view, is here to stay and um, something that um, you know involves us having to localize a platform. So, for example, at Luang, right, uh, you know, we, we started with gold, given Indonesia is actually primarily a Muslim market. And we've been able to actually graduate users towards more um, volatile products like crypto and stocks. And I think, you know, this kind of hook and cross-sell model seems to work um, very well in a country like Indonesia. And it's quite unique to a country like Indonesia. So that's, that's what I would say um, is very unique about us. Yeah. Well, what, what about you, JJ and Vince, in, in your business models, have you say, taken inspiration from from an overseas player um, or have you sort of made any sort of significant tweaks or innovations to your company's products and business models for the Indonesian market? JJ? I'm happy to go first. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so I, I, I feel very passionate about this topic from an operational perspective because, uh, but I'll try to keep it short. So. Um, so B2B is very, very different. Like, uh, you know, it's, it's a very, very kind of like local characteristics in terms of the industry if you wanted to win that B2B space. Like, um, because the supply chain and, and the industry itself is very, very different from one country to another. And especially for Indonesia, like what has been in existence in terms of user purchase, merchant behavior, selling and buying, it's, you know, multi-layered inefficiencies along the supply chain. It's something that, you know, um, again, it might not be like 100% unique to Indonesia, but Indonesia, Indonesia merchants along the supply chain like operate in a certain manner 
like it, that is very different from other countries. So you need to take that into consideration. And then when you layer that in with the topography, which is very unique for Indonesia, 17,000 islands, archipelago, very different from a conventional single land mass country, whether it's like India, China, or as well as the US. Um, I think the general kind of like strategy, you have to learn from best practices and what has been done before, but you have to apply and customize the solution and provide that for what makes sense for your home country and for the market that you are that you're targeting. So. Uh, and, and that's what Gudanada is, is, is working and executing on. So it's, it, it, it is not a kind of simple copy paste copycat uh, type of like replica model, uh, especially not in B2B. Got it. What about, what about um, Thank you, Kush. Um, yes, um, so in our case, uh, we actually have been very fortunate uh, to have a successful and supportive shareholders. Uh, uh, one of our uh, shareholders is actually the end group. Um, and they have a very successful uh, model in China. Um, however, this is a this is a really important, right? I mean, what works in others not necessarily immediately works in other countries. I mean, we can take a look at what kind of success, what kind of failures, and we can learn from them. But really, the most important is to we understand the market and how we can create a product and services and technology um, that fit to the market because there's so so many components in it. So. Um, for example, in Dana, right? Um, uh, we have now over 900 employees, and um, over 64% of our engineers are, of our employees are actually engineers, and these are Indonesian engineers. Um, and because they are Indonesian engineers, so everything that they build, every user interactions, user experience, interface, system, um, uh, flow, uh, journey, everything is um, thought of. Um, uh, and build for the Indonesian customers, right? And we also are a highly regulated environment, right? So we have to report to the Bank of Indonesia, um, you know, the, the Ministry of Communications. Um, there's some more coming up. Uh, uh, and, uh, and those are the kind of things that's completely different from country to country. So, and for us, in order to comply fully, in order for us to build a system that is actually a fit for the Indonesian market, um, it, that's really, really important important part of building a successful um, uh, technology company, right? And, and that has been indicated in the last uh, two years. I mean, because we are very Indonesia um, and people found it, it's, um, it's very relatable of how the experience is all about. That's why our, our app is, has been um, uh, consistently uh, the top uh, ranked app in a, in a country in both iOS and Android uh, in a financial category. Uh, we're also being invited um, uh, more times by the regulators, for example, to, to become key technical lead. Uh, for example, one of the initiatives is uh, Open API, or we call it SNAP initiative. Uh, and there is also more and more of the working groups that um, uh, related to the payment that's really going to help uh, our digitalization initiative in the countries. And we're involved practically in all of them. Um, Chris, for example, the QR Indonesian standard. We are one of the first company that actually 100% comply in Indonesia. And all of this, all of this initiative, all of this work, all of this technology, all this team is actually developed in-house uh, from our team, where we take the learning of our um, you know, great shareholders, uh, uh, success, the great success of our shareholders, and turn that uh, learning into something that is actually uh, localized. Amazing. I mean, it's a, it's a lesson I learned pretty quickly that, you know, if you think you, you can just take an external business model as it is mm -hmm. to Indonesia, it's not going to work for very long. No. <laughs> yeah, we've actually, had a, we've actually had a question from one of the one of the attendees, which I think is relevant to um, some of the conversation we were having about um, the growth you've experienced during the pandemic and whether it's sustainable. I think if, if you look at some of the recent earnings reports of other large tech platforms regionally, You'll see what a massive role things like incentives and promotions have played in their in their growth. As you think about your businesses, and I'm sure you use incentives and promotions as part of your, all of your business models. Like, how do you see that playing out um, during onboarding? And do you think that you need to keep doing it to make users stick around, or do, they, do users tend to stick around even now after incentives are removed? Yeah, I guess I, I don't mind answering this question. Um, since our consumer app. Yeah, so I think, you know, Pulong, we've been really blessed. Um, from day one, we've been gross profit positive. 
you know, right now our payback period on a user acquisition is actually only four months or less. So, I mean, in general, you know, I think the way we, we like to think and believe in Plum is in order to actually grow, we have to build a sustainable business model. Um, and I think promotions and incentives do have a part to play, right, in making sure that, you know, you do grow and, um, you know, you have like kind of especially you need to compete in a land grab phase. But, you know, at the same time, I think you, you kind of have to ask yourself at one point, you know, do you have to build a sustainable business model? And as we are, you know, I think, and at least from the wealth tech lens, right, um, we have seen in Indonesia that, you know, while incentives and promotions is quite important for the initial onboarding, we are able to actually obtain a very quick payback period on every user that we onboard. Um, so maintaining that positive gross profit is actually kind of a signal that, you know, we it, when you have true product market fit, you actually do not need to give cash back in order and, and have maintained like negative gross profit margins in Indonesia um, in order to grow. I mean, that's just a view that we've taken from day one. Uh, and I think in my view, this is uh, re like kind of important, especially with the recent turbulences in the in the economy. Yeah, I Vince completely Jay. agree with Claudia. Sorry, yeah. um, and that's the thing, right? Uh, you have to understand what is, uh, um, what is the strategy of your promotion or incentives. Um, are you using it because you want to uh, maintain your users? Or are you using it just because you want to grow? Or are you using it as actually because you want to educate your customers, right? I think that's the key here. And understanding that um, promotions and incentive is actually is just a way for you to let people try. And that means educating. It's not for making people stay. Because if incentive and promotion is an X factor in having your people to stay, it's becoming a feature. So it's no longer a, um, a marketing uh, initiative. And that's always been one of our very important metrics when we have any kind of product launch, when we have any kind of like a user um, healthiness metric, right? So how much of uh, the incentive that we need required for the people to um, to try? And then after that, um, do, how do we see when the people stay, are we doing it to incentivize them or not? If it's not that, that's what we're, we're it's the product and the use case that we push. If it is, then, then we need to work again because there's definitely something wrong because like Claudia said, right? Uh, the fit, the value proposition uh, uh, matching to the users is not there. Yeah, I, I, would, I would just add on as a last point, uh, we couldn't agree more with Claudia and Vincent on this. So very, very focused on the unit economics as a business. Uh, in, in, in the B2B space, um, the general kind of like wholesalers or kind of like the, the retailers resistance towards kind of like uh, from offline to online, uh, you know, in the starting phases of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the industry kind of like evolution requires uh, education and that means some promotion and incentive that goes in there. But, you know, there's also why with like, you know, with education on the ground that comes you know, if you look at kind of like 12 months ago in 2020, end of 2020 versus end of 2021, we've been able to, when you strip out the incentives and promotions, uh, which we've periodically dialed down, like increase the net take rate and revenue by kind of like seven, eight times over the course of like 12 months. So uh, that just tells you kind of like the direction of how we're treating that. And in reality, like uh, instead of relying on that promotion incentives, like the true the, tr the true power and network effect really lies in social commerce or it really lies in kind of like word of mouth and referral marketing because you have the right online experience and right transaction journey not because of the loyalty or the incentives that you're that, that you're putting into the system I, I don't know how this happened but we've got three three very sensible founders that are not treating promotions as, as features um i see that a lot so um this is quite, quite refreshing to to Two, two, two founders and one uh, um, CFO. So, <laughs> yeah, well, even more important to you. With with a with a with a with a founders mentality, hopefully. Yes. <laughs> Good call yeah. by the CFO. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we we do talk a lot about digital disruption um, 
But there is actually an existing incumbent financial services industry in Indonesia, and at the center of it are traditional banks. Um, they've been pretty key to whatever financial inclusion has existed until recently. Um, we've all read over the past year about tech companies and conglomerates rushing in to buy traditional banks. You know, car platforms are buying banks. You know, ride-hailing firms are buying banks. Like Vince, maybe maybe love to get your view because I mean, as a, as a wallet, there's often like a question mark about what's the future state for a wallet. Um, can, love your perspective on it to start us off. How do you see it playing out? Do you have any plans to pick up a stake in a bank? I think um, that's the thing, right? So um, when we set out, as I mentioned at the very beginning, right? When we set out at the company vision and mission and our core purposes, right? Our core purposes is to be an open platform. And really as an open platform, we have three stakeholders. One is the user, second is the merchant, three is the financial institutions. So I think that's really, really key here. For example, like Claudia is one of our financial institutions um, customer. Um, we want to make sure that all of our financial institutions partners uh, are really happy um, when we have this ecosystem. Because as I mentioned to you, right, um, as well, that the um, digital payment is really becoming uh, the initial touch point for um, everything going further into the digital of uh, you know financial services. Um, and we're not here to to replace them because bank are uh, playing an important role in the market. Uh, you, I mean, all of us here, we've been banking with uh, the same bank with our family for a very long time. It's very difficult to replace that, right? It's a, regardless of what kind of um, features, products, or initiatives that the banks has, for us to move it, that's gonna be very, very difficult. We're probably gonna have a secondary, some people might have, uh, you know, uh, third and fourth banks, uh, but it, um, generally their main bank is, remains the same over time. And that, that's a trust that we don't want to replace. Uh, what we do instead is to make sure that we can work together with the, with the, our banking partners to have their instruments, to have their financial services to be available in our platform. And the way that we uh, shift it, because uh, as you, you know, um, from, from the data itself, right, there's a lot of underbank, there's a lot of unbanked because the traditional banks has been um, uh, pretty difficult for them to reach out to this market fast enough um, for, for the national expectations. So we, our job is actually is to help reach them together by creating a product, a daily product uh, that can fit to this customer's need. And when we do that, we don't have to do it ourselves. We have to be, we can work together with the financial institutions through our technology, to our scoring, to our um, risk management of uh, um, authentications, uh, all of this, you know, heavy background uh, backend technologies uh, that uh, that we built, you know, over all uh, the long period of time to make this happen for all the participants. So um, it's a very long uh, kind of answer, but at the end of the day, we always see the banks as our customers, and we do hope to keep continuing uh, working with the financial institutions down the line forever. Claudia, JJ. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not happy to take this one first. Um, so, I mean, we look at it from a different um, perspective, obviously, because uh, we are, um, you know, we, we operate in a different field here. So for us, uh, what's happening right now, like in the space in terms of kind of like um, picking up a stick in banks and all and, and e-commerce players, you know, uh, taking a stake and buying banks and, uh, you know, increasing the fintech ambitions. Great thing for us. Um, the more evolved the fintech ecosystem is, the more comprehensive the set of plausible solutions on payments and financing for stakeholders, and that includes the merchants and customers on our supply chain. And our strength, uh, we, 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 need, we need to play where, where, where our focus is and where our strength And Our strength ultimately lies in uh, the more than half a billion um, US dollars of NMV and transactions that we complete successfully on our platform on Gudangada every month. And the aim is really to leverage on that transaction data and analytics, uh, you know, and work closely with financial partners and address working capital constraints that our merchants face to complete that digital transformation journey for them more than anything else. So um, in a nutshell, I think we would make great partners for financial partners who have acquired Digibank's banks, banking licenses, want to tap into that very valuable livelihood related purchasing slash selling transaction data in the B2B market. Um, beyond just the B2C and the C2C as well. So that is um, 
that is that is how we're looking at it from a from a financial uh, from a financial partnership perspective. Yeah, I think um, you know, I'll just add something short here. I, I really, I mean, I think Luang, we are huge ecosystem players. Um, we believe in the concept of growing together. I think not everyone, you know, I think a lot of people try to treat fintech as a winner's take all market. And I actually super disagree here, uh, where, you know, I think we have amazing partners like Vincent here from Dana, um, but also GoPay and, you know, some of the other fintech players and also the digital banking and traditional bank partners that actually make things possibility, right? Um, especially for wealth tech, I think while the app itself looks really simple, if you actually dig a little bit deeper on the back end, the banks that you know power the exchanges, the banks that power the clearing houses, the banks that power you know the forex exchanges, um, basically to for offshore payments, etc. These are infrastructure that is actually needed for you to become a really strong wealth tech player, right? And on the customer onboarding side, you know, players like Dana, Gopay, et cetera, who have actually really built a very seamless experience for payments or auto debits, et cetera. This is actually really essential uh, for players like us. So Indonesia, uh, given we are a country that's, you know, more developing market, and we have a very close knit community, the way people do business here, is actually a lot more gotong royong or, you know, Gotong Royal meaning like you actually work together a lot more and you really focus on your partners and um, being basically close friends with everybody in the market. And I think that is the way we like to operate at Pluang. And I know how most Indonesians like, like to operate because we're not here to do business for just the next five years. We're here to do business for a few decades, right? Um, and the world is pretty small. So we are here to also support banks. We're here to work with everybody basically. Um, there's been a really interesting question from, from the audience about demographics of digital adoption. Um, and I think this will play out very differently for each, in each of your businesses. What, what are you seeing in your user base? Is it mainly younger populations that are using solutions or are you seeing a more, more sort of a spread now over time of different age demographics using your, your products? Uh, I know it'll play out quite differently in each of your industries, but love to get, love to get a quick view. JJ, what do you see? Is it all all the, all the young guys, or is it is it a, a broader demographic? Well, um, it's a little bit different for 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 B two B because the uh, the the stakeholders here, uh, you know, typically can be uh, you know if you're on a manufacturer side, it would be an MNC. It can be either like international or kind of like local. And a lot of the local conglomerates, local wholesalers, or local distributors in FMCG, for example. Uh, you know, they would have been in business for many, many years. Uh, but interestingly, you know, you have the trend of them like thinking about succession planning, understanding that they need to move from offline to online. And then like, you know, like the next generation starting to take over. So it is really, you know, it's hard to kind of like pinpoint down to kind of like the demographics, but you know, um, it is a, with a combination of education and go to market strategy. I would say that, you know, um, they are increasingly palatable to kind of like moving online. And there is obviously a push from the millennials or the second generation to try to like, you know, want to scale up their business or kind of like shift from like the offline to online, at least for a partial piece of their business from B2B. Yeah. Got it. What, what about you, Claudia? It's, are you seeing a broad set of demographics or is it skewing very young? Yeah, uh, so I think like Flung especially, right, we, we are really targeted for the first time investors. And so, you know, over 80% of our users are under the age of 30. Uh, and I think this is really exciting, right? The reason that's really exciting is because, I mean, honestly, like for most people, they'll start investing maybe typically in their 30s or even 40s, right? Um, so having younger people actually start investing early, kind of making their mistakes earlier is actually quite exciting. And um, also what enhances our CLTV over time since retention is very high on most all tech platforms. So I think that's that's a really interesting thing. Yeah, in our case, um, uh, it's, uh, well, it's more on a uh, similar path of first adopters into the late adopters kind of a graph. So in, in initially, when we first started in the first uh, two or three years, we have a lot of the generation Z, uh, the centennial. 
and then it's moved to millennial. And now we're seeing um, tremendous actually growth with Generation X. So that that is interesting, right? Uh, um, it's a uh, it's it's uh, the growth itself um, are similar to the trend of uh, you know the adoption rate of uh, uh, the things. What I'm happy about is um, it's it's that um, the centennial and the millennial they don't shift, so they keep using it while the generation X actually feel probably uh, getting more knowledge from from the the younger. Uh, family members, and then they started to feel it's like, hey, maybe I should try it, and then they're happy about it, and they keep using it. So um, I think that's generally um, all infrastructures kind of a, a business uh, uh, going through that trend. Got it. Um, look, we're, we're going to run out of time soon. Uh, there's a few more things I'd love to cover. Um, we haven't talked about capital raising. Uh, all, all of you raised pretty significant capital, capital rounds recently. Um, where, where, where do you see Indonesia um, in that context? You know, has the world changed in the last few months um, with the steep sell-offs that we're seeing in tech stocks? Do they impact you? Do you think, do you think they impact the regional startup ecosystem? Um, Claudia, I'd love to get your views. Oh yeah, thanks for sure. Yeah, so I mean, I think in general, um, you know, obviously there's been sell-offs and valuations in the West have really been impacted. But I don't think it actually changes the fundamentals of any business, right? Um, for example, for Pluang, like funded accounts continue to grow quite significantly. Payback periods, they at four months or under. So the fundamentals of our business actually has not changed. And so, so I think, you know, I think, you, you know, we're uh, personally, we're not super focused on fundraising. I think we're just very focused on execution, et cetera. But I think there's still a very high appetite um, for, for, I think, good companies. So what we're going to see is, I think, a consolidation for good quality companies with very strong payback periods, strong gross profit businesses. And for businesses that, you know, have not unproven unit economics, it is going to get much harder to raise at high, higher valuations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. JJ Vince, any any thoughts on this from your? Perspective? Yeah, I would, I would, I would, I would, I would hate to kind of like, like you know, unanimously agree with, uh, with, uh, with, the, with the panel on this, but unfortunately, I will have to. Uh, but I would just <laughs> add that, like, uh, macro wise, you know, we see a lot of dry powder remaining on the sidelines, right? When we speak to investors, uh, I think earlier stage and seed round companies, pretty much business as usual. Um, you know, I think Indo from a macro level remains a key beneficiary for, for, for global market corrections, uh, implying capital allocation shift also increasingly towards Southeast Asia and Indonesia is a big beneficiary of that. Uh, we've seen that play out in the last 12 months. We expect it to be so for a while, given the growth opportunities in this region. And growth stage companies, to Claudia's point, I think the companies, the right strategy, execution and traction continue to be funded at a, at a strong level. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's starting to be a kind of like differentiation path between like the ones um, who have the traction, the ones who have the right unit economics and right fundamentals versus the ones who don't. I think it's going to be a little more glaring. So, uh, you know, we're excited for what is to come and, uh, you know, again, focus on execution more than anything else. Okay. Okay. Let me try to uh, make it short because we all have, we only have under three minutes, right? <laughs> Um, so I think the euphoria of, of um, very easily raising money, it's, uh, it's already kind of a, a lesson. Um, um, and I think uh, there is uh, many factors in the market that's really outside of everyone's controls, right? Um, uh, uh, with the, the war in Ukraine, um, I really hope that everyone's uh, you know, uh, uh, praying for uh, everyone's there to be okay and the world can return to normal and then the pandemic is uh, actually impacting a lot of the um, economic uh, uh, of uh, of tr even traditional businesses right all over the world um, uh, and we've started to see um, uh, that the fats all over the world are uh, increasing the interest rate to make sure the market is not too heated so i think the euphoria of uh, uh, what we call uh, ease, easiness to invest is uh, starting to, you know, slow down. However, um, I think this is now really a time for everyone also to take a look. The companies that have the right economics, that we have company that have the right fundamental, and keep focusing on that. Um, I think it's going to be the differentiation uh, differentiator as well, uh, and that's really important, right? I mean, we cannot just grow for the sake of growing. We all always have to, we all have to grow because there is an economy economies of scale. We have to grow because there is a market potentials that is actually have the right unit economics that can make us sustainable. 
So those are the kind of things that um, I truly believe that everyone, uh, the investors, uh, the startups, uh, the technology companies are going to put more focus on. Got it. Well, <clears throat> I had some other exciting questions to ask you, but unfortunately we've, we've hit time. Uh, just want to say thanks to you guys for taking time out of your busy schedules, building, building businesses, very sensible businesses with, that don't use incentives as features. Um, and uh, thanks also to the audience for joining the panel discussion. Appreciate it. Thank, thank you so much. Awesome. Um, thank you. Good to share a uh, panel with you, Claudia and JJ. Hope to see you guys in real again soon. Okay. Yeah, Take see care, you very soon. Thank you so much. See ya. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Bye.